For our reading from Scripture today, we go to Paul's first letter to the church at Corinth. Uh, Paul had a rather um, challenging relationship with the brothers and sisters in the Corinthian church. Uh, they were very human. <laughs> And uh, as the young church was developing, uh, they encountered many of the issues that still go on in the church today. And uh, in this particular passage from his letter that we know as the 11th chapter, beginning at the 17th verse, Paul is addressing uh, their coming together to eat together uh, and practicing Holy Communion. He says, now, I don't praise you as I give you the following instruction because when you meet together, it does more harm than good. First of all, when you meet together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you, and I partly believe it. It's necessary that there are groups among you to make it clear who is genuine. So when you get together in one place, it isn't to eat the Lord's meal. Each of you goes ahead and eats a private meal. One person goes hungry while another is drunk. Don't you have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you look down on God's churches and humiliate those who have nothing? What can I say to you? Will I praise you? No, I don't praise you in this. I received a tradition from the Lord, which I also handed on to you. On the night on which he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread. After giving thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this to remember me. He did the same thing with the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Every time you drink it, do this to remember me. Every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you broadcast the death of the Lord until he comes. This is why those who eat the bread or drink the cup of the Lord inappropriately will be guilty of the Lord's body and blood. Each individual should test himself or herself and eat from the bread and drink from the cup in that way. Those who eat and drink without correctly understanding the body are eating and drinking their own judgment. Because of this, many of you are weak and sick, and quite a few have died. But if we had judged ourselves, we wouldn't be judged. However, we are disciplined by the Lord when we are judged so that we won't be judged and condemned along with the whole world. For these reasons, my brothers and sisters, when you get together to eat, Wait for each other. If some of you are hungry, they should eat at home so that getting together doesn't lead to judgment. I will give directions about the other things when I come. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. One of the dangers of marriage is that you live with someone so closely and for so long sometimes that they get to know things about you that perhaps you keep hidden from the rest of the world. Not only do they get to know those things, but sometimes they even feel a need to point them out. I don't want to admit it, but my wife has my number. And I have hers, too. One of my personality traits that Jean discovered, and I know it drives her crazy, is that when I, when I want to avoid something, I sometimes just smile and nod as if I'm going to do it, but then don't do it. Somewhere along the line, I learned that one could get away with, with, without having to face something hard by just pretending that you're going to face it, but never quite getting around to it. I'm not sure where I learned that, but if I didn't learn it uh, in the church, at least it sometimes was reinforced in the church. 
For the church is pretty good at avoiding the hard issues of life and faith by pretending to face them. On this Sunday, which we call World Commun Communion Sunday, we are joining the rest of the world in saying that we believe in communion. We believe in the teachings of Jesus, which he hands us in this new covenant sealed by his blood. Like millions of other Christians around the globe, we, we put out our grape juice and bread this morning to engage in an act of worship that we have said is so sacred we call it a sacrament, a sign of God's grace. Like those other Christians, we will, we will go through all the motions that, that we have come to know as Holy Communion. But the question is, will we really face the hard reality of communion? Or will we just pretend to be in communion with one another? and our Christian family around the world. Communion is hard. It's even hard for brothers and sisters in Christ who know each other well. One of my ministry colleagues told a story one time of how hard it was for even people within the very same congregation to be in communion with one another. He said one night at a weekly church supper, they decided to, uh, to ask people to take a number when they entered the fellowship hall and then sit at the table uh, by what number you were given, the various tables around the room. See, see, they were attempting to get people to mix it up, to, to, to sit with someone different, to, to get to know someone maybe new. He said, word quickly spread about what they were doing and they had people that turned around before entering the fellowship hall. They got back in their cars and they left because, because they didn't want to have to sit and eat with somebody new or different. Yes, communion is hard. And if we go through the motions as if it is not, then, then we're being less than honest. We're being phony. Worldwide communion. Can we really expect to accomplish that if we, if we can't even come together sometimes with other Christians in our own church or across town or across the aisle? How in the world can we honestly say that we're going to be in communion with Christians who, who may be wearing a turban on their head or may be worshiping in a grass hut or drinking real wine from a common cup in a Gothic cathedral or sipping from a Dixie cup in a prison chapel. There's so much out there to keep us apart that, that may seem so legitimate and real to us. Maybe that's why the Apostle Paul felt the need to remind us how hard communion is when he warns us to not make a mockery of it by just pretending to be in communion. Paul says, if you come and you receive communion with your brother and your sister before you've settled things with them, then you're spitting on the remembrance that Jesus left us and we certainly don't want to do that. Strangely enough, it's, it's the act of communion which in history at least, and up until today, has kept some Christians apart from one another. There are still Christian communities, denominations that won't commune with those outside their church or their denomination. The preacher and former bishop in the United Methodist Church, Will Willimon, points out the irony of that when he asks, why has communion, especially the attempt to define Christ's presence, been so divisive? Our divisions are no more evident than at a table and the people you would eat with and wouldn't eat with. We're smart enough to know that eating is a very intimate activity. You take care of whom you invite to dinner. 
He said Southern segregationists were, were smart enough back in the early civil rights times to, to know that they had to keep black folks away from lunch counters because if you dare ask people to sit down with you together, even at a lunch counter, that, that then you've got to admit that yes, they are human beings that are deserving of equal treatment. We also know that barriers are most readily broken at a table, right? For the meal is an intimate, communal, uniting experience and and it's also a risky experience, scary time when we sometimes try to erect boundaries. But for Christians, it ought to be, coming to the table ought to be a sign of unity. It's a tragedy, he says, that of all things that this should be a mark of our divisions. For more than anything else, Jesus wanted the people who followed him to love one another as he loves them. Now, does that mean we all have to be alike? Does that mean we all have to think alike? Does that mean we all have to worship in the same way? Does that mean that we're, we're to give up our individual identities? No. Jesus embraced the fact that God made us all wonderfully different but in our differences, we are still to come together and to commune. Does it mean we have to be perfect in every way before we can share in this meal? No, certainly not. For remember, Jesus sat at the table and served the very one he sensed would soon betray him. It's not perfection Jesus is asking of us as we come to the table. It's rather honesty and humility and forgiveness. What a privilege it is for us to come to the Lord's table this morning. And isn't it really cool that we sit at a worldwide table with Africans and Asians and Europeans and South Americans and Australians with Catholics and Pentecostals, and Baptists, and Presbyterians, and folks who don't even claim a denominational name. We sit at a table with college professors, and Special Olympic medal winners, and with single moms on food stamps, and wealthy philanthropists. We gather today with children, maybe too young to even know what's being put in their mouth, and the aged barely able to swallow the elements given. We share this meal with convicts, forgiven of their sins, but still paying the penalty for their actions. And with upstanding citizens, forgiven of their sins, but still burdened with unresolved anger and guilt. On this worldwide Communion Sunday, may we, may we celebrate all things that bring us together with brothers and sisters both around the globe and down the street. And let us recommit ourselves to sharing a gospel message of God's love and forgiveness for all the world. Let us think about and surrender those things which keep us divided. Let us work together for the things which Jesus gave his life for. One of the things that has been such a profound blessing to me being a part of this family of faith is that when we were organizing this church and the idea was being developed, I had several folks say to me, I don't think that sort of church will work in Anderson. Uh, and of that sort of church, uh, I mean a church where we completely open the doors and we encourage people to come together who would otherwise never come together. We encourage folks to kind of step out of their comfort zones and com relate to folks who, who live in a whole different world, even though it's right here in our, our same community called Anderson. Also, uh, the model of church that we followed had brought 
Christian folks from various churches, backgrounds, and denominations to come and serve and be a part. And I had some who felt that couldn't possibly happen in Anderson, but it has. So today we've got Baptists from First Baptist Church here to serve our lunch. And last week there were Methodists here and the week before that Presbyterians. Sometimes it's Roman Catholics. Sometimes it's non-denominational churches. So God smiles when, when his people come together. When, when we lay aside those things which, which may legitimately cause us to, to think differently or to approach a situation differently or deal with a particular uh, way of worship or theological issue or, or, or social or political perspective differently, but we see that beyond those differences, which make us beautifully unique, beyond those differences is some, some common unity that is so powerful. And what is that unity? It is this promise when Jesus said nothing. Nothing can ever separate us from the love of God. God loves us all. And God calls us to love each other in the very same way. Let's pray together. Prepare now our hearts, O God, as we are invited to this, your table, to partake of this holy meal when we celebrate the gift that you have given us through the sacrifice Christ has made and on our behalf.